Hello everyone, this is day 11. Today we're going to talk about random variables in general, and then more specifically, discrete random variables. Hopefully you'll know what that means by the end of this video. And then we're also going to talk about their parameters, because these things simulate a population, so we use the term parameters. As an overview, here we are in the second unit where we start talking about the preliminaries of inferential statistics. You have already seen two videos in this unit where we talked about basic probability and two probability rules. And today we're going to keep going into probability by talking about a random variable. After today, in the next video, we're going to talk about two examples of discrete random variables. That's binomial and Poisson. Those are very important. And then after that, we're going to talk about continuous random variables, in which case we'll cover the uniform distribution and the normal distribution. Each random variable has its own distribution. Okay, and then after that we're going to talk about sample means and the central limit theorem, which will help us to understand point estimates and confidence intervals. Now, sample means and central limit theorem, all of that requires an understanding of random variables. From here on out, we're going to be talking a lot about random variables. So this is a very significant lesson. Okay, and then after we've covered all of that, then we're going to have the second celebration of knowledge, and then we'll begin the third unit, which is all about hypothesis testing, p-values, things like that. Very exciting. Okay, the goals for this lesson is to know what a random variable is and to know what a probability distribution is. Uh, that those are sometimes referred to as PMFs, probability mass functions. This is related to the histogram. So the histogram is weaved in and out of this whole semester. Okay, and then we want to know what the parameters of random variables are. All right, so and that will make sense by the end of this video. Okay, so what is a random variable? A random variable is a variable whose value is determined by chance. Usually, this is notated by a capital letter. The set of all possible outcomes that a random variable can attain is called the set of possible outcomes. The set of possible outcomes is the set of all values that x can assume. The notation is a capital S, and then you subscript the name of that random variable. So if it was x, it's S subscript x. Now, a probability distribution is a function that defines the probability of each outcome of the random variable. The notation is f with a subscript of the random variable you're talking about. This is sometimes written as just a p, where you don't use a subscript for the random variable. You use the lowercase version of it, and that's sort of enough to communicate what random variable you are talking about. That's the same convention here. You've got this lowercase version of your uppercase random variable, and that lowercase version represents a particular value, a determined value that that random variable could be. And what this function gives you is the probability that that big, that that random variable equals that particular variable x. Okay, we will look at an example of that right now. Let x be the result of a single die roll. What is its value? That is determined by chance. So what are the pot set of all possible outcomes? If it's a six-sided die, x could be 1. That would be the result of a single die roll. Or it could be two, two, three, four, five, or 6. Now we need our function. Our function is going to take as input, one of these possible outcomes, and as output is going to be probability. Let's draw a table. Here's my possible outcomes, and here's my probabilities. So if x is 1, what is the probability of a single die returning 1? Well, that would be 1 sixth because the uh, symmetry of the die suggests that each face is equally likely to appear on top, and so 1 out of 6. This little table here defines my probability mass function. And if I put in anything other than 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6, I get 0. The probability of big X equaling 0, that's just 0. The probability of it equaling 1 half is, one, is 0. It won't equal that. 
but the probability of it eating, equaling anything in this table is going to be 1 sixth. Okay, now let's get a little bit more complex. Let's say that x is the sum of two dice rolls. What are the possible outcomes of that sum? The lowest sum of the two is two. It could also be three, four, all the way to 12. That's the biggest it can be. What is this probability function? What is the distribution of x, this new random variable? We need to compute probabilities. To figure this out, I have constructed a table of all possible outcomes that can occur from rolling two dice. I distinguished between two on the first die and one on the second, and one on the first die and two on the second. The reason I did that is because I want each of these outcomes to have the same probability. So, I have 36 total outcomes. Each one is equally likely. When x equals 2, there's only one outcome that makes that occur. So the probability is 1 over 36. On the other hand, for 3, there are two outcomes in which that will happen. So that is 2 out of 36. For 4, there are three ways of achieving that. So that's 4 out of 36. And that's those outcomes. If we continue this way, we get the following. I'd like to point out my mistake. I put a 4 there when I meant to put a 3 as the probability of x being 4. So just by looking at my chart, we can see that the thing that will have the largest probability is that diagonal, which corresponds to outcomes that have a sum of 7. And so that is the largest. And also by looking at this chart, you can see that things sort of repeat itself. So 8 will actually have the same probability as 6, 9, the same probability of 5, 10, the same probability of 4, 11, the same probability as 3, and 12 will have the same probability as 1. And with that, we get the whole chart again, from 2 to 12. And that is our probability mass function. That is the distribution of the random variable x. Every random variable has its own distribution. Now let's talk more about discrete random variables. There was an example of a random variable and its probability distribution. Let's talk about discrete random variables. For a random variable x to be discrete, Sx, remember that's a set of all possible outcomes, must be a quantitative discrete set. The probability of any one outcome is needs to be between 0 and 1 including 0 or 1. And that is the probability mass function. The third requirement that must be met is that the sum of all possible outcomes must be 1. Sometimes you will see it written like this, where the sum is over all possible outcomes. Sometimes you will see it written more explicitly like this. But the idea is the same. It's the sum of your probability mass function over all possible outcomes. Continuous random variables, on the other hand, are slightly different. For a random variable x to be typo there, sorry about that, continuous, yes, x, the set of all possibilities, must be a quantitative continuous set. It's an infinite set that has, like, all numbers, like real numbers in it, a bunch of real numbers in it. This function here in the continuous situation is called the probability density function. It is not exactly the same as a mass function. This is a function associated with any continuous random variable. It has to be positive or equal to zero. The second condition is that the integral of the probability density function over all possible outcomes of x, that integral needs to equal one. Okay. Now, basically what that means is that the area underneath the curve of the probability density function needs to equal 1. We will discuss that more in Chapter 5, but this is just to give you a flavor of what continuous random variables are. They're a little bit trickier. That's why we're talking about discrete first. These are notations from calculus. No calculus will be necessary for this course. We're just going to talk in terms of areas, and we're going to use tables to do the integrals that we can't compute. Let's move on. 
to two examples of discrete random variables. Flip two coins. Let x equal the number of heads. x is a discrete random variable because it equals some value, but we don't know what that is. It's determined by chance. What are the possible outcomes here, number of heads? Well, you can have zero heads, one head, or two heads. Now we need to compute the probability mass function. So we have our possible values for x, and then the probability that big X equals that little x. When big X is 0, the probability of getting no heads is, well, let's make a little table here. That would be two tails, but you could also get tails, heads, or heads, tails. I differentiate those two so that they are equally likely. And then I have heads, heads. So for 0, it's just associated with tails. That is a 1 in 4 chance. For x equals 1, that's associated with heads, tails, and tails, heads, and there are two of those. So this probability is 2 out of 4, which is 1 half. And then lastly, the probability of getting both heads, that would be when x is 2, the probability of that is 1 fourth, for the same reason as before. There's just one in four outcomes that meets that condition. And so there is my table. Let's check that it meets the requirements. First, this thing here is all discrete and quantitative discrete. So that meets requirement one. Next is that each of these are all between zero and one. So that meets requirement two. Next, Observe that the sum of all of these, 1 quarter plus 1 half plus another quarter, is 1. And so the sum is 1, and so that meets requirement 3. It is indeed a probability distribution for my random variable x. Now what I would like to talk about here is this concept of using a random variable as a model. How did I determine these probabilities up here? I did that all theoretically, using a theoretical approach to probability. I actually did not flip a single coin, and yet I was able to compute these probabilities. If I had flipped some coins, or better yet, ran a simulation in some scripting language, this is the scripting language called Julia, which is similar to Python. It's what I do most of my research in. If we were to make a little simulation that samples either a head or a tail, and it counts the number of heads, counts the number of heads, and then it returns that count. And then it gives me a big list. So this actually has 100 outcomes in it. And I count all that, so if I basically simulate me flipping two coins 100 times, I'm going to get some empirical estimate for the probability. Look what I'm going to get. So what did I get? I got 0.2. One time in five, I get no heads. And then 55 out of the 100 times, I got one head. And then a quarter of the time, I got two heads from this simulation. Now if I ran this a thousand times, which is not shown here, but if I ran it a thousand times, now look at what the frequencies are. This one here is 0.24, which is very close to 0.25. This one's very close to 0.5, and this one's again exactly equal to 0.5. So here, it might say it's the real simulation. This is empirical. And this here is theoretical. And look at the results I get here. 0, 1, 2. Theoretical, I get 2, 5, 5, and 2.5. My point is that sometimes we can think up a random variable and compute its probability using the theoretical approach in order to model the actual thing that's going on. So this here is a theoretical 
model for flipping two heads. Notice also that the distribution table for the probability mass function approximates the relative frequency table. Okay, we have discussed random variables and we have seen that they work as a model for a actual occurrence. Something that you could, you know, if you could repeat the trials a hundred or a thousand times, you would have a sample. And then you could get statistics from that sample, such as these relative frequencies. These are statistics. These are proportions. Because the theoretical tries to understand what's actually going on, this is regarded as a population. We regard the random variable as a population, and so it has a mean, and the mean is denoted by mu, just like other populations. We usually put a subscript under it so that we know that it is the mean for that random variable. The way that you determine the mean of a random variable is to take the sum of all possible outcomes multiplied by the probability of that outcome. So you could also write that as the sum over all x in the set of all possible outcomes times the sum of x times that probability mass function. So let's write this out. It is the sum of all possible outcomes multiplied by their respective probabilities. Okay, now what's the median of a random variable? Well, this is actually a little bit too complicated for this class. You're basically looking for some value, which is sometimes denoted by eta, which is a Greek letter, and you're looking for this number so that if you sum up the probabilities of the outcomes less than eta, it goes to one half. So eta is this outcome that divides the distribution in half. Okay, but like I said, that's too complicated for this class, so let's not even worry about it. The mode of a probability distribution, x, is whatever x has the biggest mass at it. This is the thing that has the highest probability of occurring. Let's write that down. And so remember that this random variable is associated with a frequency chart. The probability distribution function is associated with a frequency chart. Relative frequency. And we define mode by the outcome that has the highest relative frequency, or the highest frequency. This probability approximates the relative frequency. And so the thing with the highest probability is going to be your mode. Okay, now mid-range, you find it the same way you would if you had a big list of numbers. You take the largest possible outcome. You add the smallest possible outcome. You divide by 2. And that's your mid-range. More parameters of a discrete random variable. So we're looking for the measures of spread now. Again, we regard the random variable as a population. The range is the max of Sx, the biggest element in the set of all possible outcomes. We subtract from that the smallest element in the set of all possible outcomes. That's the mid-range. Max of x is not really defined, but the max of a set is. Now, what's the standard deviation here? When we did that standard deviation in class, we multiplied the terms by... So, okay, so there was the sum, and there was the different outcomes, minus the mean, and that was squared. But remember, we multiplied it by the frequency, by the number of times that it occurred, and then we divided the whole thing. We multiplied by the frequency of x, and then we divided by the total number. 
that was the sum of all the frequencies. So remember how we did that? We multiplied by the frequencies, and then we divided by the sum of all the frequencies, minus 1. That was the n minus 1. Well, we can do that here. We're going to take the sum, and then this frequency of x, of that x, divided by the sum of all frequencies, divided by the total, is an approximation for the probability of that x. So this bit right here, if I were to distribute in the denominator, is equal to the probability of x. And so that's why when we're trying to compute the standard deviation here, we take the sum of each term here, x minus mu, the mean of x, square it, and then multiply that term by the probability of x. Now, we're not going to divide by n, because remember, that dividing by the total number, that is already in this empirical probability. And then, because it's the standard deviation, we took the square root. And so that's what we do here. Now, this right here, this is your answer. That is the standard deviation of a discrete random variable. For a continuous random variable, it's a bit more tricky. There's an integral involved, but we're not going to discuss that now. The variance is just going to be whatever that standard deviation was squared. The sum is over every possible outcome of x. Subtract the mean, square it, and then multiply by the probability of x. That gives us our variance. Very much related to finding the standard deviation using a frequency table, which we did in class. That's because a probability distribution is an approximation of a frequency table. It's very important. If you understand that, then a lot of other things are going to make sense. Let's take another example here. Let's go back to the example with the dice. So we want to find these parameters. So I want to find the mean, for example. So x is going to equal the sum of two dice. And so that is going to equal the sum of all possible outcomes times the probability of each outcome. All right, let's go ahead and write that all out. Remember, there are 11 different outcomes. So here we go. And there it is. And I plug all that in my calculator, and I get 7. And so that is the expected value when you roll two dice. That's what you would expect to get. Okay. Uh, yeah, so just uh, sum all that up, and that all equals 7. Now let's talk about the variance. The variance of x is going to be the sum of all possible outcomes minus the expected value times the probability of that particular outcome. And so that is going to equal, so my expected value is 7. So we're going to get, oh, and then we square it. So that's going to be negative 5 squared, because in the first case, I've got x equals 2. So that's negative 5 squared times 1 over 36 plus negative 4 squared times 1 over 18 plus negative 3 squared plus 1 over 12. And if we do that, we get 5.83 repeating or basically just 5.8. We'll go ahead and round it since my data for the x is rounded to the nearest integer. So we'll just say 5.8, and that's my variance. The standard deviation now is just the square root of my variance. In this case, that's going to be 2.4, and that's my variance. 
Okay, now it says here, don't forget units. And right, in general, we shouldn't forget units. But what are the units here? Dots, I guess. It shows you the sum of all the dots. Okay, well, if it's dots, then we expect to see seven dots. This one here is going to be dots squared, how, whatever, however that works. And this one here is going to be dots again. All right. Now, the range rule of thumb and significance. So recall that according to the range rule of thumb, the value is significant if it is more than two standard deviations from the mean. All right, let's take a look at our dice example. We know that the mean is 7, and the standard deviation is 2.4. The lower um, threshold for whether something is significant is going to be 7 minus 4.8. And that gives us 2.2. The upper threshold for whether something is significantly high is going to be 7 plus 4.8. Which is going to equal 11.8. And so we conclude, so we conclude that 2, which is less than 2.2, our lower threshold, is significantly, oh, <laughs> silly me, is significantly low. And 12, which is greater than 11.8, is significantly high. And so those are unusual values. The last thing we need to discuss for this section is the expected value and what it means in an application. Denver Honeycutt is trying to make some money by hosting a game of chance at a carnival. Each player pays $5 to play and gets to roll a die. All right, now, if they roll a 1, 2, or 3 then they get $1 back. It's not as good as the 5 that they paid, but they get something. If they roll a 4 and a 5, then they get their $5 back. And if they roll a 6, they get $10. So they made $5 total. If many people play, can Denver expect to make any money in the long run? Seems pretty good in that he's... You know, a one in, he's got one in three, no, three in six chance of making four bucks. But will it really pan out for him? Because every sixth time, he's going to lose $5. The way to do this is to pick your random variable and find the expected value. So let x equal... Let's see, we're concerned about Denver here. Let x be the change in Denver's funds. Okay, the change in his funds for one play of the game. So he's the house, so what happens? Let's come up with a probability distribution. So what is SX in this case? What could happen to Denver? The change in funds after one play could be plus $4, could be plus $0 if they roll a 4 or a 5, or it could be negative $5. See what happens here? If somebody plays, they give Denver $5, but then... If they roll a 1 or a 3, he has to give back 1. The net change in Denver's funds is he just gained $4. Now, if they roll a 4 or a 5, Denver gives the $5 back. and There is no net change. And if somebody rolls a 6, then Denver has to pay an additional $5. So his net change would be negative $5. Now we need to come up with the probability distribution function. 
So what's the probability of a net change in four? That means they roll the one, two, or three on a die. And so that is actually three chances in six. So that's one half probability of that happening. The zero change in Denver's finances is because they rolled a four or five, and that's two out of six chances. So that's that's one third. Let me just write this a bit more explicitly. So this is three over six, and this right here is two over six. If he loses five dollars, that was because they rolled a six. There's a one in six chance of that happening. Now that I have that, I can compute the expected value, which is the expected change in Denver's funds, theoretically. So that's going to be 4. Remember, that's the sum of each outcome times the probability of that outcome. So that's going to be 4 times 1 half plus 0 times 1 third minus 5 times 1 sixth. And so that equals 2 minus 5 sixths, which equals 1 and 1 sixth, which is 7 sixths. 2 is 12 sixths, so that's 7 sixths, which is about $1, because what's the, what's the units here? Dollars times probability doesn't have a unit, so it's dollars. One dollar and thirty-three cents, and that's for a single play, because that's what X is. X is the change in funds after a single play. So that's a pretty good gig there for Denver, on average, or in the long run, Denver will make one dollar and thirty-three cents each play. So what that means is that if he gets 100 people to play this game, theoretically, he's probably going to end up with $133. So that's if 100 people play. Now, it's the variance. We could compute the variance here, the volatility of that. But basically, if he does this 100 times, he'll probably get something pretty close to $133. It may have more, may have less. The variance will help us to determine how volatile, how tightly it converges to that. Okay, very good. Is that a fair game? Well, what is a fair game? A fair game is where the two opponents, we've got Denver and the other person. You could think of it as that. A fair game is where each party stands to win or lose equal amount. And so since we're talking about the total amount of funds, this would be what would be called a zero-sum game the fairness of the game would have an expected net change of zero. That would be a fair game. So a fair game is one in which the expected net change is zero. This is not a fair game. This is highly in Denver's favor. This is why the house always wins, because if you compute the probabilities with these games, roulette and crafts and all that stuff, you will always find the expected value to be in favor of the house. Okay, let's go ahead and recap now. We started by introducing random variables. Those came in two kinds. There was discrete, which had probability mass functions as their distributions. And then you had continuous random variables, and they have probability density functions, which describe their distributions. Every random variable has some sort of a probability distribution. It might be a probability mass function, or it might be a probability density function. But either way, they have a function that determines the distribution. And the distribution tells you the probability of the possible outcomes occurring. After that, we looked at parameters. We found formulas for computing the mean and standard deviation of random variables. And then we looked at significance using the range rule of thumb. We ended by an example of how you can use expected values in application. One final thing I'd like to reiterate is that random variables constitute what's referred to as 
a stochastic model. Stochastic just means probability. When we're talking about models, they use the word stochastic. Stochastic is a really great word to know. It's a very scary sounding word, and it's, but it really just means probability or uncertain. It's a probability model. Random variables are a stochastic model. It's the way that we model uncertainty. Okay. All right, everybody. Very good. Have a great day, and we'll see you in class.